It feels like spring here with temperatures near 70 and a dew point near 60. But it's completely different when you go up north. Here's a live shot from the Northwest Territories. This is Aklavik, located northwest of Yellowknife, and you can see the temperature there currently minus 44 Fahrenheit, and that's without any wind chill. You can see that they're reporting a few elements of stratus at 100 feet, and that's given us that kind of hazy appearance you see just off the ground. That's a little bit of ice fog that's lifted off the ground, and they only get a few hours of sunshine, and there's about 19 or 20 hours of nighttime. And those low clouds help to radiate some of that heat away into space. Well, it's certainly getting cold in the Arctic. We now have numerous instances of minus 50s. Norman Wells and up north in the Mackenzie River Delta, and of course up there in northern Victoria Island. The minus 30s cover this entire area of the western Arctic. And we're expecting some of that air to start coming south. Here's perhaps one of the first really cold outbreaks. This is starting into Edmonton, approaching Saskatoon there, and heading south. But further south, we do have the initial polar outbreak. And that's extending from about Madison, Wisconsin, down to St. Louis, Little Rock, and just past Dallas. Now, this is not exceptionally cold air. You can see behind it, just teens and 20s and 30s and 40s further south. However, this is going to be the first of a series of cold blasts coming south. And, of course, following in the wake of that, we'll have this next one entering the Dakotas, Minnesota, and Nebraska in the next day or two. A piece of this Pacific air mass has moved into the western U.S. and driven that cold front south all the way through Yuma, through Phoenix, and through Flagstaff. And winds are north in a lot of places there in the southwest. And out east, we're still hanging on to that stubborn high. The axis running from South Carolina up to the eastern Great Lakes. However, west of there, we're starting to build that southerly flow and bring up warm conditions. And down south, tropical air making its appearance. Lots of 50s and 60s dew points south of this new warm front, which should be hooking into this polar system, and we may see a frontal wave out of that. And what we want to do at this stage is briefly correlate the pressure and thickness chart with that surface analysis. So what we see here is a band of thickness contours running from the southwestern states up to Iowa. That's going to mark the leading edge of that cold front that we analyzed. And we can kind of trace that all the way up towards the western Great Lakes. In the southern U.S., the thickness banding is kind of uniform, but still we're going to need to put that front on the southern edge. So that's going to be right in that region. So our, the front that we analyzed is pretty close to that. Now there is a front lurking further north, way up there in the Hudson Bay region. Well, for some reason we don't have any Canadian sectors. So we'll have to settle for this one, but you can see the thickness packing right up there in the Hudson Bay region, and that's going to mark the northern location of that warm front. And that's the feature we have right there. These temperatures in the eastern Hudson Bay region, 25 degrees. So these temperatures in eastern Hudson Bay, 25 degrees. That's going to be very mild for January. And compare that with what they got on the other side of the bay, minus 20s. So we can match that up with the heights and vorticity chart up at 500 millibars. That's about 18,000 feet. And this shows a very broad jet covering much of the U.S., but we can isolate that down to the key axes. Looks like one right there in Nevada, another one going into the Central Plains, emerging in the Midwest, and another offshore near New Jersey, heading southeast. So we can expect the jet max right there around Kansas City, 
and another Jet Max in the Las Vegas area. And using our basic rules of thumb, we're going to find frontal systems somewhat like that for a basic starting position. And this other Jet Max in Nevada supports a system down there. And that's pretty much in the ballpark with what we have on the surface chart. And then looking at the 300 millibar chart for North America, we've got a temporary blocking pattern right there. See this little cutoff low going underneath the ridge and to the north of that we've got this cutoff high on the north side of that jet. So that's going to lock up the pattern at least for a few days and that will keep much of the U.S. under this northwesterly flow. So moving that forward we do have this jet max coming across British Columbia that's going to dig southward. There it goes. So by the weekend, northwesterly flow covering much of the central and western U.S. that will help bring in some of that cold air from the Northwest Territories. And then going into next week, not much movement on that southern portion of that polar vortex, but it will be hanging around Ontario and the Hudson Bay region, and that will keep things fairly cold. Then going into the end of next week, we see the polar vortex pattern shrinking a little bit, and we're left with a couple of weak centers, and those shrink down to a large weak vortex in northern Canada. And by the 16th, we've returned to more of a normal pattern. Polar vortex up over northern Canada, and that should generate a little bit more cold air. But as we can see, the flow is becoming very zonal, so that will probably make it harder for cold air to come very far south. Now, as you can see, the forecast for tomorrow morning, based on the past four days of model runs, have been remarkably consistent. So we're scrolling through four days of models, and the positions on these systems are pretty close. However, this system in the Great Lakes appears to be moving a little faster than forecast, and that's caused the winds to gradually back with each model run and running this forward. You can see that brings a lot of the cold air more into Wisconsin. And this purple that you see here, this is all below zero tomorrow morning. Yeah, I forgot to introduce this. This is the model trend loop on Pivotal Weather. It's a really neat feature. You go up to the top and they've got this model trend loop and you just click that right there. And you can get the same thing on your screen. Now for Saturday, the bulk of the cold air does start rolling out and this has more of a southward trajectory. So running these models forward, it appears the GFS is trying to develop a frontal wave right in that area for Saturday morning. How does that play out for Sunday morning? Well, here's where things get sketchy. The earlier models had the cold air diving south into Texas, Arkansas, and Oklahoma. But what you'll notice is when we run the models up to this morning, we get a tendency towards cyclogenesis on the high plains in Colorado. See, there it is. And that'll hold back the southward progress of that front. So we're actually looking at the, the flow kind of being backed and upslope through Nebraska. And very limited southward progress just to the Red River for Sunday morning. So the low pressure center located right there. Meanwhile, Arctic blast through Wisconsin. Temperatures below minus 10 there during the morning, but a little moderation as it crosses the Great Lakes. And these are minus 50s up there in Saskatchewan and Manitoba, so I don't know if anybody wants a piece of that. Let's run this into Monday. And this is where things get kind of sketchy. The models, as you'll see when I run this forward, they flip-flop on cyclogenesis there in the plains. So we'll bring that forward. So it's kind of wavering back and forth between a low pressure center in the Panhandles, West Kansas, and just plunging the air mass southward. But it seems like we're kind of converging on 
some sort of low in the panhandles. That'll still break the southward progress of the front, but that's going to be about where it's going to be located early Monday. So it still appears to be a little bit warm there down south. But then for Tuesday morning, it appears the models are agreeing on some sort of wave along that front. You can see that little trough located right there, actually a low pressure center. And if we run this forward, you can kind of see how that evolves. The model from Tuesday morning had it advancing pretty quickly eastward. Then it moved it back to the west, then back east. But it appears there is some sort of wave in Texas. And at this point, the models are converging on keeping that out to the east. So that should bring the cold air southward on Tuesday. And look at that. Zeros all the way down to Kansas, down to Missouri. All of this is sub-zero. And finally, let's see how it looks for Wednesday. See, we're getting a lot of good information from comparing the model consistency and looking for trends. And for Wednesday, there was some variation on precipitation in the southern plains, but the latest model runs have kind of went with a dry southward passage. So the earlier runs were bringing that cold air south, but with some precipitation developing. But you'll see that the latest runs have converged on bringing a lot more cold air south. That started yesterday morning. And look at that right there. It's backed off a little bit on that, but it is bringing the bulk of the cold air south behind that wave out there to the east. And that'll bring teens and 20s all the way down to Texas. The northeast U.S. also getting some sub-zero weather and zeros all the way back towards far northeast Washington, almost all the way to Vancouver. This is a, quite a chunk of cold air, and this has yet to finish heading south. So next week does look cold for a big chunk of the country. And where the rubber meets the road is really going to be with snowfall because Fresh snowfall insulates the air mass from the ground and helps some of the heat radiate away into space. So obviously we're going to lay down some precip in the Great Lakes area, but this Alberta Clipper and that upslope flow we were talking about in Nebraska should get some precip going, snow coming down in that area anywhere from 1 to 3 inches, and that will be a possible source of cold air generation next week. So there it is. All we need is a couple of cold nights to start radiating that heat away. That's certainly happening in the Great Lakes. And let's go into next week. Some more snowfall. Kind of a weak Alberta Clipper or a weak Pacific system. Moving through on Tuesday. Maybe some sort of upper wave. But that is fresh snowfall. Looks like some snow indicated around Wednesday. So this is all going to be a breeding ground for some polar air. And looks like another wave coming through late next week around Friday. So that's another reinforcement. The only area not really getting any snow looks like around Grand Forks down to Minneapolis. But they're going to be right on the edge. And of course, any of this could change. So with all that snow on the ground, that should help solidify the idea of next week into next weekend being pretty cold around the U.S. And just a quick run-through of the European model. I mean, we could be here all day looking at this stuff. Pretty much got the same idea as the GFS. Putting much of the cold air in the Great Lakes, Wisconsin, Michigan. And then the second shot, holding back in Texas and Oklahoma, and finally coming down around Thursday or Friday. Maybe a little later than what the GFS had, but... That is a pretty significant volume of cold air. There it is on Friday next week. That's all sub-zero Friday morning. And that air is going to have to go somewhere or it's going to have to modify. It's going to have to be one or the other. And you can see a chunk of that does go into Nevada. Let's see when that happens. Yeah, that's going to be crossing over around midweek. And that'll probably get some cold conditions in the southwest and eventually it will make it in the Mojave Desert and maybe get the Santa Ana winds going around the weekend of the 13th and 14th. 
and even some canyon winds right there in Albuquerque later next week. You can see those come together. So it should be windy at some point in Albuquerque, El Paso, and Alamogordo. There's a look at the camera at Norman Wells where it's minus 38. Again, stratus very, very close to the ground, and that's kind of instrumental in getting the air mass even colder than it is right now. There's this other camera looking to the south and uh, some sort of weird artifact up at the top. And there's the setting sun to the southwest, just not doing very much. And there's one more clip in Joe Haven, Nunavut. A little further north, the sun's a bit lower, but it's also minus 38 there. Anyway, that'll do it for this edition of Forecast Lab. Hope that gives you some useful information for the upcoming week. We'll be back once again tomorrow for our Friday edition, and we hope to see you then. Take care. Bye-bye.